Teaching Blast. Technical seminars are an Intertech production. For instructor-led.net, Java, and XML courses, visit us at www.intertech.com. Well, welcome back to Chapter 7 of the Windows Azure Boot Camp. And the title of this particular chapter is Basic Worker Roles, where we'll learn what exactly is a worker role and how to communicate directly with a worker role in what are known as input and internal worker roles. But in addition in this chapter, we're also going to learn how to use local storage and what are some of the other things, other stuff you can do in Windows Azure. Now, before we get into this chapter, one uh, caveat is that working with worker roles in a direct communication fashion requires a great deal of knowledge of WCF. So if you're unfamiliar with the Windows Communication Foundation, essentially a framework for developing SOA applications in .NET, you might want to review some of that material and at least brush up on WCF before taking on some of the challenges you'll see in this chapter. So what exactly is a worker role? Well, it's an application that's going to run again in our Windows Server 2008 environment that's in the actual cloud, just as all boxes, or if you will, virtual machines are inside of the Azure cloud. We'll be running on .NET 3.5. And the focus of worker role, unlike that of web role, is on back-end processing. In other words, non-HTTP service hosting types of applications. By default, it doesn't even allow for inbound connections. So a worker role, very much like a web role, has an entry point. It's called worker role CS. And the high level worker role is actually fairly easy. We have an on start method, just like we saw with the web role CS, which is kind of a kickoff point. And then the run method. And the run method typically serves in an internal loop that just allows us to do some sort of crunching of data or process. You can communicate with worker roles either via message queue or directly through WCF. We have both internal and external endpoints available when we want to communicate with a worker role directly. Of course, when we're dealing with direct communication, this again brings in that complexity of WCF into the picture. And you can't really exit a worker role. So in this run loop, we're just going to continue process until forever. If we tried to exit a worker role, that would just cause the Windows Azure environment to start up another instance. So what are some common uses for worker role? Batch processing. Again, looking at queues and processing the work established inside of a queue by some sort of other process, maybe a web role. Doing non-HTTP hosting, again, of things like WCS services. Essentially number crunching. Before we get deeper into web uh, worker roles, let's take a quick divergent into local storage. Each role, whether it be web or worker, can define a certain amount of local storage space which it can use. This is protected space on the local drive out in the actual Windows Azure cloud. It's considered volatile storage in that if the role goes away, if it falls down or is moved to a different server, that volatile storage is also gone. We can define several resources for that particular storage. And that storage resource is set up to be a size between 1 and 20 gigabytes. And where do we define this local storage? Well, in our configuration XML files. So for example, in the service configuration file, should we have a role that needs local storage, we'll set it up as a local resource. And each storage is again set up individually, giving it a name and a size between 1 and 20 megabytes again and also dictating whether or not that particular storage should be cleaned up when the actual role is recycled. So for example, if you restart a web role or a worker role, clean on role recycle set to true would mean that that particular local storage is empty on every recycle of that role. How do we use that local resource, that storage? Well, we'll use the role environment uh, object again to get the local resource by name. In this case, files upload, backing up one slide here, is the same name that we would see as the name defined in the XML configuration file. 
once we have that uh, local resource, we can use it just as we would any kind of file space off in our hard drives, uploading or downloading files into that space. Remember again, however, it is volatile. So should the roll go down, that data is lost. Where exactly is this data? Where is this local resource, this file space? Well, in the dev fabric, you'd actually find it out on your C drive in a location located under your particular user account on your box. In the actual cloud, yes, there are actually drives out there on those servers as well. Again, remember, they're just Windows 2008 servers. We find an actual drive and a directory with a GUID associated to our particular role where that file is kept. Now, we couldn't access this file directly. Again, that's protected from us by the cloud, but it actually does reside, this file space does reside out there in the Windows Azure cloud server. Okay, and now back to worker roles. As we talked about in the Qs chapter, one of the best ways to provide for communications with worker role is via Qs. Another word, another process, say a web role, would deposit a message into a queue, and that message would give information to the worker role about what type of job it needs to complete. Alternately, if you'd like, you can set up direct communication with worker roles, with worker roles that are either known as external or internal endpoints. External endpoints, which are more formally known as input endpoints, are useful to expose your worker role publicly, even outside of the Azure Cloud. And when we set up a public, in other words, input endpoint, we'll actually be allowed to use an Azure load balancer to spread those requests across multiple input worker roles. Internal endpoints are used essentially, as the name implies, for internal processing. Endpoint endpoints, again, also known as external endpoints, expose essentially a WCS service, WCF service, excuse me, to the public. Again, either in or outside of Azure. And they enroll the use of an Azure load balancer to spread the request from the public across potentially many instances of this endpoint, input endpoint worker role. You can use HTTP, HTTPS, or TCP IP as essentially a communications protocol to communicate with that endpoint. The internal endpoints, however, expose the WCF service to other internal instances, whether they be web or worker roles, inside of Azure, not publicly. Therefore, these particular endpoints, these particular worker roles, are not load balanced. Any kind of load balancing you would like done with these particular worker roles, you have to manage on your own. And again, you can again use HTTP, HTTPS, or TCP to communicate with these particular endpoints. Typically, internal endpoints are used in what we call a peer-to-peer -peer fashion, essentially a one-to-one -one fashion with some sort of other role out there that needs work accomplished. So a typical endpoint model looks like this. We've got some sort of client out there be it public or maybe a web role, that using load balancing will be requesting the services through what we call endpoint worker roles. Again, those are the external facing publicly available worker roles. The load balancer is able to spread requests across multiple instances of that worker role. We'll use internal endpoints in kind of a one-to-one -one fashion to help take on part of the load or maybe a complex process with each one of those other internal endpoints, excuse me, input endpoints, might need assistance with. For more free learning resources and to see the latest lineup of our instructor-led .NET, Java, and XML courses, visit us at www.intertech.com.